Double Identity, Chapter 31. Maybe it's a prank, Josh says, unconvincingly, or just a coincidence. Is there some other Walter Cole who lives here? Someone whose last name really is Cole? And it's not an alias? Josh had tried to argue that the mention of Walter Kroll in the computer was a coincidence, too. I look over at Mertley, and her expression is skeptical. I think Nancy Patterson works in the advertising department at the reporter, Mertley says. I'm going to call her. Merle turns on her heel and stomps off towards the house, a woman on a mission. Joss looks at me doubtfully. I think we should finish up here, she says. We don't have much left. In fact, the only patch of leaves left is under Elizabeth's tree. I'm getting a blister, I say. I hold up my hand for evidence, and I want to hear what Merle finds out. Joss's expression is a battle of emotions, as if she wants to protect me but doesn't know how. Okay, she finally says, giving up. Joss puts the rakes away, and I head towards the house. When I reach the kitchen, Merle is already on the phone. That's all you can tell me, she's saying. No, no, I don't want you to lose your job. Merle hangs up and sits for a minute, staring at the phone. Nancy can't tell me anything, she says despairingly. The customer asks for confidentiality. So unless I'm Walter Cole, or unless I involve the police, she looks up slowly. You know, you hand me a crying five-year-old, and I know exactly what to do. You give me a kid who doesn't know his alphabet, and usually I can give him reading, and at least a little by the end of the year. People say I'm a comfort to have around at funerals. I'm pretty good beside hospital beds, too. But this, I just don't know. Should I call the cops? Call Bridgie? She should be asking Joss, not me, I think. She's the adult. But Marley's dark eyes are peering at me, searching my face for answers because I've got more at stake than Joss does. It's my parents, my privacy, my secrets. I don't know what would happen if we called the police. I don't know what would happen if we didn't, which action keeps me and my parents safe. I open my mouth, though I have no idea what I should say. I'm just so good at collecting words, I think, not using them. The doorbell rings. Merle scrambles up, seeming relieved by the distraction. I peek down the hallway after her. Maybe it's my parents, I think. Maybe it's the police. Trick or treat, someone screams out. It's a pixie, a fairy princess, a werewolf, and a zebra. His black stripes draw on in a white sweatshirt. None of them comes up any higher than Merle's waist. It's Halloween. Oh dear, Merle Dithers. I totally forgot it was trick or treat night. No, wait, I don't look so disappointed. I've got the candy. I bought it last week. I just don't have it right next to the door. Would you like to step in out of the cold for a minute while I go to get it? We're not allowed to go into strangers' houses, the fairy princess says, self-importantly. A woman emerges out of the dusk behind her. It's okay, the woman says. We know Mrs. Wilker. She was Sammy's teacher, remember? The trick-or-treaters step in, and I duck my head back into the kitchen, out of sight. I'm not scared of pretend pixies, fairy princess, werewolves, and zebras, but the woman might be someone else who remembers Elizabeth. Merle zips past me and rummages through the cupboards, muttering, I can't believe I forgot about Trick or Treat. I've been so distracted. She rips open a bag of stickers, three musketeers, Milky Ways, and Skittles, then rushes back out to the kids. Here you go, she says. Oh, don't be shy. Take two or three. Bye. Happy Halloween. Joss comes into the kitchen through the back door, just as Merle returns from the front of the house. Can you believe it's Trick or Treat night, Merle says, and I forgot? All the kids were talking about it at school today. They were so excited. But then I saw the newspaper and the teacher's lounge and everything else went out of my head. What did they say down at the newspaper office, Joss says. Nancy wasn't allowed to tell me anything, Merle says. Not unless the police get involved. And even then, don't call the cops, I say quickly. Because I've decided all of a sudden, I didn't even want a trick-or-treater's mom to see me. Just didn't want our names mentioned in the Sanderfield Reporter. Why would I want my whole life laid out for some policeman? Well then, Joss says, want to go trick-or-treating, Bethany? I stare at her in disbelief. One minute I'm being asked to decide big questions. The next I'm supposed to shimmy into some infantile costume and collect candy from strangers. No thanks, I say. And yet, back home, I'd been planning to go trick-or-treating this Halloween. I'd gone last year. My friends and I dressed up like Powerpuff Girls. Going retro, we called it. 
just because my friend Molly had been really into the Powerpuff Girls when she was three or four. I'd fought with my parents because my dad insisted on walking with us. Nobody else's parents are going, I'd screamed at them. I'd made them stay several paces behind us, and I'd laughed harder than anyone when Molly joked that he was dressed up to be a stalker, or maybe an undertaker, with that scary face of his. I was just a kid last year. Marley was whirling around the kitchen, grabbing back salad out of the refrigerator, muttering, chicken patties are quick. It's going to be a long night, Joss says. Mom always gets dozens and dozens of trick-or-treaters. She washes her hands and takes a tomato out of Marley's hand to begin chopping. Can't you just turn out the lights, I say? Pretend no one's home? Marley looks horrified. Oh no, the kids are counting on me, she says. But at a time like this, when my parents are... I can't finish the sentence. I don't know what my parents are, besides missing, and I can't bring myself to say that. Marley stops zooming around long enough to pat my shoulder. Believe me, honey, if I thought I could do anything else to help your parents right now, I'd do it. But just sitting in the dark, waiting, pretending to be absent, that's not going to help anyone. The doorbell rings again, and Merle rushes out to answer it. This is her way of dealing with everything, Joss says, sliding the tomato into the salad. I was so mad at her when I was 13, that first year after the accident, when she still wanted to celebrate Christmas and birthdays and Easter, and the first robin that showed up in the spring. But it does help. And short of calling the cops, what else are we going to do? You should pass out some of the candy too. It'll cheer you up. Only in a mask, I say bitterly. No problem, Joss says evenly. By the end of the evening, Mom will probably be in full costume. And strangely, Joss is right. An hour later, after we've gobbled down our chicken patties and salad, interrupted six times by trick-or-treaters, Merle is wearing an enchantress gown and peaked hat, and Joss is dressed like a scarecrow. The trick-or-treaters who come to the door are ooing and awing over them as much as Merle and Joss ooh and awe over the trick-or-treaters. Then Joss goes back into the kitchen to wash dishes, and Merle says, I've got to go to the bathroom. Can you answer the door the next time it rings? Um, I say, since dinner, I've spent most of my time slumped down on the couch, out of sight of the door, pretending to watch TV. Here, Merle says, tossing me one of those fake noses with the dark glasses attached. It's followed by a raggedy Ann wig that she's dug out of a box. You need to get to the spirit of the holiday. I put the glasses over my glasses and arrange the red yarn hair over my hair. And somehow that does make me feel better. More anonymous, anyway. And anonymous is good right now. When the doorbell rings again, three seconds later, I pick up the huge bowl of candy Merle left out on the table and open the door. Trick or, wait a minute, you're not Mrs. Wilker, a pumpkin with arms, legs, and a head says. No, but I've got candy, I say. Want some? I drop a Milky Way and a Snickers and a package of sour Skittles into his bag. He beams at me from beneath green construction paper tendrils that are evidently supposed to be his pumpkin vine. Wow, thanks, he says. After that, Jocelyn, Merle, and I take turns passing out the candy. Most of the time, Merle knows the kids and makes a game out of trying to guess who's behind some of the masks. Now, I know that wouldn't be Timmy Rogers and such a scary costume. What's that? It is. Wow, Timmy, that makes me feel a whole lot better because I know you'd be a nice monster. She chats with the parents, too, and it's like she's truly an enchantress holding court. It's childish and silly, but I can see why she didn't want to miss Halloween. By 7.30, the constant parade of trick-or-treaters has trickled off, and Merle Joss and I are sitting on the couch with our feet propped up on the coffee table. Merle's huge bowl holds only a sprinkling of candy bars. I guess it's safe to eat one now, because we're not going to run out, Merle says, unwrapping a Snickers. Want some, Joss? Bethany? Joss grabs the three musketeers. I start to reach into the bowl, then freeze. What would Elizabeth have chosen? If Elizabeth loves Sour Skittles too, will Joss and Merle tell me? Did Sour Skittles even exist 20 years ago? The doorbell rings again, and Merle and Joss groan. I'll take care of this one, I say, glad of the distraction. I grab the bowl of candy and head for the door. I open it, thrust out the bowl, and start to say, Here, take two of whichever kind you. It's not a trick-or-treater at the door. It's a man dressed in a business suit. Hello, Bethany, he says. So much for being disguised. I draw the candy bowl back against my chest, 
holding it like a shield. I squint at the man, through my two layers of glasses. He's got close-cropped, gray hair and a heavily lined face. He's a big man, not fat, but bulky. I don't recognize him exactly, but I know his voice. He was the man in the car the night before the town square, the one who scared me. Tell me, the man says, is your dad around? I glanced frantically back over my shoulder. Joss is already up from the couch, coming to my rescue. Who are you looking for? Joss asks, stationing herself by my side. Bethany's father, the man says, Walter. I notice he doesn't say a last name. Walter's not here, Joss says, raising her chin defiantly. Where is he? I can't tell you that, Joss says. Would you like to leave him a message? Just tell him I stopped by, the man says. He'll know why. The man turns around and begins walking away. He's on the steps down from Marley's porch when Joss calls out, Wait a minute, who are you? What's your name? The man looks back at us, his eyes narrowed. Walter knows who I am, he says, then turns away from us again. He finishes descending the stairs, walks down the sidewalk, opens the gate, begins to slip into the shadows. Dalton, I whisper. I raise my voice, shout out after the man. Is your name Dalton? The man hesitates just for a moment. He seems startled, but then he keeps walking away from us into the darkness. That's it, Joss says. I'm calling Bridgie. Chapter 32 It takes the policeman more than an hour to get to Merley's house. Sorry, he says, easing into a chair in Merley's kitchen table. He takes a sip of the coffee she's placed before him. It being Halloween and all, I had to deal with an egging over on Vine Street and some kids' toilet papers, Mrs. Wade's trees, again. Now, what seems to be the problem here? Merle and Joss give him an extremely abridged version of the last five days. They don't say anything about my maybe being a clone or about my father sending 10,000 in fake birth certificates through the mail. The only parts they quote from his letter are the first three sentences. He's chasing me, he's hunting me down. I thought he would stay in prison. They don't offer to show Bridgie the letter. Bridgie listens carefully, the furrow on his brow getting deeper and deeper. Okay, he says when Joss and Merle are done. He looks puzzled. You want me to put out a warrant for Dr. Kroll on child abandonment charges? No, Merle says. Walter is just a little troubled right now. It's the man in the car we're worried about. Bridgie flips back through his notes. It's not illegal to offer someone a ride, he says. It's not illegal to put an ad in the paper. And if he's even the one who did it. It's not illegal to knock on someone's door and not leave your name. It's not illegal to look for somebody. And if Dr. Kroll feels like he's being chased or hunted, if he's already in some kind of an uh, unstable mental state already, changing his name and well, that's not that guy's fault. Bridgie taps his papers with his pen, almost jauntily. The man hesitated when I asked if his name was Dalton, I say softly. I think he's Dalton Van Dyne. I'm standing behind the policeman, trying to stay out of sight, because we've all taken off our costumes now. But when I say this, he turns around to peer at me. I bend my head forward, so my hair covers my face. Uh, right, Bridgie says. We've got a lot of, a lot of ex-con and buzzler millionaires retiring to Sanderfield. I decided that if Joss and Bridgie really did date in high school, I hope it was Joss who broke up with him. I hope she broke his heart. I know this all sounds a little strange, Merle says, but isn't there anything you can do to help us? Just as a favor, I'll check with the reporter about the ad, Bridgie says, and I can check with Chicago about the terms of Dalton Van Dyne's release. There might have been some stipulation about him having to stay in the country or something like that. I can't say I'd mind getting a commendation for finding him here, but it's not very likely that it's him, you know. Bridgie gulps down the last of his coffee and stands up. Joss walks him to the front door. Merle shakes her head sadly at me. Maybe we should have told him everything, she says. I don't think he took us very seriously, but at least he's helping some. I shrug and drift off into the hall. I lean against the wall, feeling utterly drained. I'm not really trying to eavesdrop, but I can hear Bridgie and Joss talking by the front door. Doesn't it freak you out having that girl around, Bridgie is saying, looking so much like Elizabeth. I wince. It's as if he's hit me. I thought I was hiding so well. I thought my hair always covered my face. 
I thought he hadn't even noticed. It's not Bethany's fault, Joss says. That makes me feel better, but I strain to hear Bridgie's reply. I guess, Bridgie says. You'd think after all these years, it'd be easier than this, but I still think about her. Every time I go on an accident scene, I think, if only these state troopers had gotten to Elizabeth a little faster. Elizabeth was the first girl I ever kissed, you know that. You didn't really think you were picking out the love of your life when you were seven years old, did you, Joss says. I, can hear, I can't hear his response. I'm so horrified. Wonderful, I think. Bridgie wasn't Joss's childhood sweetheart. He was Elizabeth's. Chapter 33. I wake up again in the middle of the night. This time, I can't blame the cut on my leg. It's the nightmares that jolt me out of my sleep. I'm being chased, and I'm screaming. Daddy, Mommy, help me. But there's no one there. I'm all alone. All I can hear are the footsteps behind me. Just like the other night when I was lost. Big, heavy footsteps. A man's footsteps. It wasn't Joss I heard, I tell myself. It was that man chasing me. And then a man's land between seat, sleep and full alertness. I'm so certain. I can see exactly how it must have been. The man was chasing me. And when I ran, he got into his car and followed me to town square. And then he sat there in the shadows, out of sight, listening to everything Joss and I said, so he could choose the exact right moment to slide up beside us and offer us a ride. I'm out of bed and rushing for the door, because I've got to wake up Merle and Joss and tell them what I've figured out. Then I've got to call the police again and tell them about this, this solid evidence we've got now. And then I'm standing in the hallway, blinking in the harsh light that I'm really left on for me, just in case. And I'm finally fully awake. I don't have any solid evidence. I just had a nightmare. I sag against the wall outside my bedroom door, and the rest of my nightmare comes back to me. In another part of my dream, a lot of different people were chasing me. Mom and Dad, Justin Murley, gymnastics coaches, and Tom Wilker, and the grandmother from the videotapes, even the policeman. Officer Ryan Bridgman, Bridgie, except he kept changing. One minute he was a little boy, the next he was an adult. The next he was a decrepit old man turning into a skeleton, telling me, you're the love of my life, we'll be together in death. And when I kept screaming at all of them, dead or alive, was, I am not Elizabeth, I am not Elizabeth. I am not Elizabeth, I whispered to the wallpaper. But I don't really know that. I don't know exactly what it would mean to be a clone. Ever since my mother's bizarre phone call, my mind has shut down in horror every time I've edged close to certain thoughts. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, I whispered to myself. I tiptoe over to the stairs and ease down them, clutching the railing the entire way. I remember to skip over the squeaky second step. Downstairs in the dark, I turn on the laptop computer and the full lamp. The computer hums itself to life, and I stand there in my pool of light staring at the icons on the screen. It's just like pixels, I tell myself, digital bits of information. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but megabytes can never hurt me. I sit down at the computer and type two words into Google search, human cloning. Any computer teacher, any media specialist I've ever dealt with will be proud of me because I'm so efficient gathering my information. I learn about replacing the nucleus of one cell with the nucleus of another. I learn about rabbits and sheep being used as low-tech artificial wombs for other animals. I do not even feel faint because it's all so scientific and remote. I did not know how I could do this so completely separate, my brain and my emotions, so I can think without feeling a thing. I take a break from cloning research because I'm thinking so well now that I have a genius moment. If I want to find out if the man who came to the door tonight really was Dalton Van Dyne, why don't I just look at the embezzler's picture online? Okay, it's not exactly a genius moment. The policeman would have thought of it if he had taken us seriously. Joss and Merle would have thought of it if they hadn't been so upset. But I'm the one who's actually typing the words into the search engine. I even get fancy because I don't want to waste any time. I let my, limit my search to pictures taken in the last year. Nothing comes up. Well, duh, I think. He's been in prison. It's not like he's been at summer camp, where they take pictures constantly and splash it all over the web so your friends back home can see what you've been up to and get jealous. Still, I'm a little surprised. 
because the newspaper and TV stations made such a big deal about his getting out of prison. I'd have thought someone would have aimed a camera at him coming out. I'd have thought he would have had a news conference. I rewrite my search requests, looking for coverage of him, leaving prison. But every website I can find uses oath photos from before he was sentenced. And staring at those photos, I just can't tell. Felton Van Dyne was a handsome man 13 or 14 years ago, with thick chestnut colored hair, chiseled features, and a way of looking at the camera as if to say, Oh yeah, look at me. I'm somebody very important. I am not surprised to see that some of the pictures come from People magazine when he was named one of the world's most eligible bachelors years ago before I was born. The man who stood on Murley's porch had the right height and the right build and maybe even the right features if I am remembering him correctly, but he looked so worn, weary, and worried. Maybe that's what prison did to him, I think, or just age. Images flicker in my mind of the stooped, anxious father I've always known, compared with the young, carefree father in all the videotapes with Elizabeth. I read more about Dalton Van Dyne because I can't quite bear to go back to my cloning research yet. No matter how good-looking he was, he doesn't sound like a very pleasant person. He was ruthless running the spur, taking over smaller companies and putting them out of business, laying off scads of employees. He closed down a factory in Tennessee the day before Christmas and bragged about it. He fired a secretary for spilling coffee on his desk. One of the articles I read calls him being glorious and for the first time since I've arrived at Murley's, I've decided I've discovered a new word that I like. Being glorious is perfect for such a conceited jerk. I'm almost enjoying reading about what a horrible person he was because I pretty much decided that he was absolutely nothing to do with me or my parents. My father never would have worked for such a narcissistic, heartless bragger. But then I find a Walton Van Dyne quote online that makes my heart stop. An interviewer had asked him about Dolly, the clone sheep. Of course, I think it's wonderful, Mr. Van Dyne said. I wish some of my boys had figured it out. But sheep, that's nothing. Just a dumb farm animal that's going to spend its life standing around, eating and pooping. Human clones are the real deal. The first person who can show off a human clone with proof will be hailed as a modern god. He'd replace God. i do it in a heartbeat. You know me. I love adulation. I stare at the words on the screen, and the wall I built between my thoughts and my feelings comes crashing down. I shiver, suddenly fully aware that I'm sitting alone in the dark room in the middle of the night with just thin doors and fragile windows between me and anyone who might want to harm me. Joss and Murley are right upstairs, I tell myself, but I can't believe that they would be much protection against a man like Dalton Van Dyne. Because of the man on the porch was Dalton Van Dyne, he doesn't just want to talk to my father. He wants to show me off to the whole wide world with proof that I am Elizabeth's clone. He wants to ruin my life.